In this side show, we're going to take a quick look at bias and misrepresented data. Um, this is basically the times where our collection of data is wrong or it's presented in a way that is wrong enough that we're getting ridiculous results or results that at least don't represent what we're trying to actually find. Uh, for this title slide here, I put this on. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with The Simpsons, uh, on the left-hand side, we have uh, Superintendent Chalmers and Principal Skinner. And on the right, we have uh, Lisa and Martin. And the quote is basically just saying, I've randomly chosen two students for standardized testing. Uh, and anyone who watches The Simpsons will know that Lisa and Martin are undoubtedly and by far the smartest two kids at Springfield Elementary. So this would lead a heavy bias um, showing that the school is performing much better than it is if those are the two that were randomly selected for testing. Now, bias is actually a little bit complex to define really, really uh, accurately, so we're not going to bother worrying about that. We're going to worry about the overall idea. And it's basically going to be any time that uh, something happens, whether it's the way that we sample or the way that we do the questions or the way the questions are asked or where or when the questions are asked, uh, but anything that's going to lead to a result that favors one answer over another or one result over another. And it doesn't have to be intentional and it doesn't have to be um, necessarily a bad thing. It just is something that we have to watch out for. Um, anytime we have bias in a sample or in a, a study, it's going to lead to results that probably aren't accurate or correct. Um, a very common one that you are probably familiar with is that um, if you ask people, you know, who has the best ch uh, chicken wings in town, uh, if you ask a bunch of people at restaurants, most people at a restaurant eating chicken wings are going to say, oh, this place is the best in town. It's not necessarily a guarantee, but it's definitely a, a high probability. And this is why we have so many places. Uh, I, I don't know if 200 is the right number, but there, there are a lot of places in KW that advertise that they have the best wings in town. And that's not the only thing. I mean, how many uh, how many coffee shops do you know that say they've got the best coffee? How many... Um, Everyone does this. And this is a pretty common thing. Uh, now, the funny thing is, uh, I'm not much of a world traveler, but my brother is. And he said that in, in lots of parts of Europe, um, they're actually very honest about about their stuff. Um, and they have to kind of justify it. They, they don't do it like we do it in Canada and North America, where everyone can claim they're the best and that's okay. Um, he said he once went to a place that uh, advertised, they actually had big advertisements saying that they were the seventh best pancakes in whatever region it was which I think is kind of hilarious that you would brag for something like that. But um, but yeah, it, the fact that everyone brags that they're the best means that their, their sampling method is biased or they're just outright lying. Um, we already talked a little bit in the last PowerPoint about um, sampling methods and trying to do uh, random sampling so that every person in the population or everything in the population has an equal chance of being chosen to be part of the sample. And when we, we do that, we say that the sample is unbiased. Now, that doesn't mean that there can't be some coincidence um, where the, the sample is not representative, but it's as representative as, as we can get using our method without handpicking um, things to put in our sample. And as soon as we handpick things to put in our sample, it's no longer um, well, we are biasing it on purpose there by, by hand selecting or choosing which things belong in our sample. Um, the important thing to understand is that when you've got a biased sample of any kind, the results you're going to get are not going to be reflective of the population as a whole. Um, so if I'm trying to figure out the average age of high school students, um, actually, I shouldn't say me. Uh, yeah, actually, let, let's do me. If, if I was trying to figure out the average age of high school students, but I only sampled kids in my classes, uh, I teach almost exclusively grade 11 and 12 courses. So I would get a sample that is, is far too high uh, an age, and it wouldn't reflect the average age of students in the school. So some examples of, of sampling bias would be if we wanted to know what percentage of students um, were at our school were born in a different country, and I tried to sample an ESL class. Uh, obviously, that's not representative of the school as a whole, despite the fact that our ESL population makes up a, a fairly good chunk um, at the school I teach at, which is Eastwood. But it, it does change the dynamics. We, we can't assume that the entire school as a whole is going to have been born in different countries the same way that uh, an ESL class might be. 
And that doesn't, there's no guarantee that you're um, from another country just because you're ESL. You could be from a community that speaks um, primarily French or entirely French, and you've moved to a region in Canada that now speaks English. So you may not be from a different country. And likewise, you could have been from another country and spoken English before you came here. So um, there's no guarantee one way or the other, but I'm, I'm guessing the percentage of students in an ESL class who are from a different country, uh, who were born in a different country, is gonna be different than the population as a whole. And likewise, if I wanted to know what percentage of our students smoked, but I went to the smoking area to ask that question and did my sample from there, I'm pretty sure the result's gonna be much higher than it would be as a whole. And that doesn't mean that I can guarantee every student in the smoke hole is, is a smoker. They might just be out there hanging out with their friends. Um, and it doesn't mean that the students not in the smoke hole don't smoke. It just means that the ratios are gonna be different between the two. There are a, uh, a few types of bias that we should be aware of. Uh, they're, they are named types, and to be honest, um, when it comes down to doing these things, I, I don't really care if students can name the types of bias specifically, if they can explain why they think there would be a bias or how there could be a bias. So it's the ideas more, are more important than actually naming them. And in real life, you can introduce all kinds of biases that don't seem to fall into any of these categories exactly. Um, but you still understand the idea of why they might be biased. So the first type we're going to look at really quick is just sampling bias, and it's where the sample chosen does not accurately represent the population. So in the picture to the left there, um, we have the population, which is represented by a rainbow, and a good sample should also be a rainbow. It should have a little bit of each of those colors represented. A bad sample would be selecting basically all reds. And it, of course, in real life, we don't sample rainbows. We sample people. Um, but what I could mean by this is we take a population, which is um, male or female, and we sample just males. Or we have a population which is um, made up of like a high school population, but we only sample academic students, or we only sample math students, or we only sample art students. Um, could be ethnicity, could be um, just about anything. But we just want to make sure that our sample is representative of the population. And if it isn't, we will get sampling bias. Non-response bias is actually one of the more common ones that occurs in, in real life uh, sampling, especially when you're doing kind of questionnaires or anything like that. And it's basically where the results are messed up because um, people choose not to participate in the study or choose not to hand in the results. So, uh, an example of this that I actually in real life um, came across a couple years back was I was at a, uh, a union conference and one of the presenters was presenting on domestic violence. And they, they um, made a statistic that one third of people were in domestic violence situations, which um, I'm not going to comment on whether or not that's correct or not, because I, I truthfully don't know the answer, but it seemed very high to me. Um, not that I'm downplaying the... Um, the significance of domestic violence or that it happens too often, but one third seemed very, very high. And moreover, they said that um, one in 10 of people who were experiencing domestic violence reported to their union reps, which is why they were presenting at this union meeting, um, which basic math tells me that, um, and if it doesn't tell you, it will teach you later in the course, that if one third of people are in a situation and one tenth of them respond or uh, tell their union rep, then one out of every 30 um, employees should be reporting to their union rep with a domestic violence situation. And just based on that math, um, one out of every 30 people reporting to their union rep, I had been a union rep or I had been a union rep for over a decade at that point. I'd, I'd never once had a, a person come to me um, and let me know about a domestic violence situation, which either means that it's a, a huge statistical anomaly or that the numbers might be a little bit off. So I actually spoke to the, um, the researchers who conducted the study and I said, how did you, how did you co collect your information? Like, where did you get that from? And they had put a, um, I, I don't remember the details, to be honest, but they put a, um, a questionnaire on the internet, on social media. I don't remember if it was Facebook or something else at the time. Um, but there was there was no, it was basically a convenience sample where anyone who wanted to fill it out could fill it out. 
and I asked, okay, how long did it take to fill this this survey out? And they said um, to complete it in full was about an hour and a half. As soon as they said that, I, think about yourself. How many things, how many topics are you interested enough in that you would sit there and answer questions for an hour and a half? That's that's a huge amount of work. And usually surveys like that are not particularly fun um, given their very nature. <clears throat> so what that led me to believe is that the only people that would actually fill out these surveys would be people that are, are in domestic violence situations or, or have friends or family that are and have a vested interest in that topic. Uh, and I, I believe that's why their results were likely far higher than they should have been um, because of non-response bias. Uh, by the way, this could easily just be, um, you know, you, you hand out things like, uh, you know, little surveys in your schools. You've probably done this because a lot of data management classes uh, in the past have, have done these as assignments where, you know, they bring around something to homerooms and say, can you guys all fill these out? It might be five questions about whatever. And if the, the topic is something that doesn't interest people, um, so let's say it's, it's a questionnaire about school dances. Well, the people who aren't interested in school dances don't fill it out. And the people that are do, which means that the results they get about how many people want to go to the school dance are going to be horribly um, disproportional. Response bias is a more interesting one and a, and a little bit more subtle than the other types. Um, it's harder to recognize, but you kind of, you know something's wrong. And the idea here is that the survey or questionnaire or whatever it is, is being done in a way where you're kind of led towards giving a specific answer. And then their conclusions are based on the specific answer that you gave them. So an example of that, and this happens quite right, readily, um, or at least it used to, uh, they, they still do it, but it, there is less of a battle between Coke and Pepsi. There, there used to be these huge Coke and Pepsi taste tests and go figure, the Pepsi ones always showed that um, Pepsi was better of the two and the Coke ones always showed that Coke was the better of the two. And it's because if you put a, a giant um, banner up saying Pepsi over a stand and you offer people you know, Pepsi merchandise and whatnot at the stand, and then you get them to, to taste test the two and ask them, do you like Pepsi or Coke? Of course they're gonna say Pepsi. And the same is true for Coke. Uh, another real life example, I was at a, another conference, a different type of conference a few years ago, and there was a representative there from the University of Western Ontario, which I actually went to school there um, for my teacher's college. And they called me over and they're um, they like, so can we tell you about Western? And I'm like, <laughs> you can, but like I, I went there. I, I, there's nothing I'm going to really learn about that. And they said, oh, what what did you do there? And I said, well, it's Teachers College. And they said, where did you do your undergraduate? University of Waterloo. I'm a mathematician. That's where, you know, lots of mathematicians go. So um, the question then they asked was, well, which was better? Was it Western or Waterloo? And I'm like, well, this is a person from Western. I know what answer they're looking for, but I'm going to be honest anyway. And I said, Waterloo. And they were stunned. They were stunned that anyone would tell them to their face that their other university was better, despite the fact that it so was, uh, at least for the programs I did. I'm, I'm not saying Western's a bad university. My, my brother did his um, doctorate at Western. He's quite liked it. Um, just for the program I was doing, I thought Waterloo was better. And his response was, if I gave you this Western tote bag, would you then say Western is better? And I'm like, this is the most blatant example of response bias I've ever seen in my life where you're actually offering me free things if I give one answer over another. So um, that's that's what response bias is about. And um, one of the more common ones you might see on television these days is the um, Ford versus Chevy pickup trucks. So on the left here, you know, <laughs> easy now for it, don't overdo it, carrying the little wee uh, trailer at the back. So make it's basically the, uh, the Chevy people making front of Ford. And then on the right, Chevy owners thinking ahead for when they need a ride home, carrying the horse in the back. So again, um, it's these kinds of advertises, advertisements that, that make people want to give one answer over another. Um, if you're, if you're unaware of both, you usually, I mean, you can imagine if someone's standing there wearing a Ford hat and a Ford t-shirt and asks you which you think is better, Ford or Chevy, um, usually out of just the desire not to, not to have an argument, you just say whatever you think they want to hear. And that's pretty common. 
Um, for those of you who know Stephen Colbert, is he's a comedian who had his own talk show. One of the questions he always asked his political uh, guests was, I, "This is again dating myself a little bit here, but it's still a relevant example." Uh, he always asked, "Is George W. Bush a great president or the greatest president?" Those were the only two answers he accepted. Those were the only two answers offered. And from that, he concluded that George W. Bush was, in fact, a great president. Well, that's the lowest possible part of the scale that you could answer. So I don't know what that really tells you. And that was kind of his, his joke on response bias. OK, so let's, let's look at an example of how this might work if you were trying to collect data from um, students at your school. And I should point out that. Um, Response bias, or sorry, I shouldn't say response bias. Any of these biases may be determined partially by what kind of question is being asked. So um, depending on the situation or what kind of question, you may want to change your study a little bit. So for instance, uh, if I was asking students at school what their favorite kind of ice cream was, uh, I use that example a lot because I like ice cream and I like to think about that, but anyway. Um, if, if we ask people what their favorite kind of ice cream is, I, I don't know if that's really dependent that much on gender or ethnicity or um, uh, grade level or age or, you know, wh whether you're an academic or an applied level student. I don't think any of those things are, are a big uh, effect on that, so I don't think it matters as much. Whereas if I was going to ask people, do you plan on taking data management? Well, that could be dependent on a few of those things. Or do you plan on taking phys ed? Uh, that, could, that could be uh, dependent on one area or another. So we don't know what the question is. We're just going to talk about what kind of biases could occur. Um, and if we wanted to collect information from a bunch of students, we could go to the cafeteria during period one or period A, depending on how your school calls them, the first period of the day. Um, what kind of, of bias might be introduced with this sampling method. I'll let you think about that for a moment. And if you want to pause it and think about it, that's fine. Otherwise, I'm going to just continue. But you should think before I give you the answers. Now, this is going to be a sampling bias. And the reason for that is that period one in the cafeteria, who's off period one? Um, students who are off period one, two things are probably true about them. One they're probably a senior student because otherwise they would have a class period one. And uh, some people may come from schools that uh, have a weird schedule or a different schedule where that's not true. But at many schools, if you're off period one, it's because you're on spare. So you'd be senior student. Um, and the other issue is if you're off period one, but you're still at school, you're pro probably an academic student. Um, not necessarily in academic classes, but someone who is uh, motivated to do well. Otherwise, most people with period one spare just sleep in and come into the school later. Again, not strictly true. You could be there because you hate school, but that's when the bus comes or that's when your ride drops you off, which are all fine things. Um, but that's, that's the kind of bias that you could get out of a situation like that. So for our, our uh, uh, next example, we're going to actually take the same situation, but we've decided, nope, there's bias in going to the cafeteria. So what we're going to do is sample people by going around to each homeroom and getting one person to fill out the survey and then bring it down to the activity office when they're done. Now, there's a whole bunch of issues here, the first of which is how do you decide which person in the classroom gets it? Is it the one closest to the door? Is it the first person who puts up their hand, which could lead to a problem because that that's usually a highly motivated or highly um, engaged person that would volunteer quickly. Uh, but regardless, uh, what type of bias might be introduced in this sample? Same thing. Think about it. Pause if you'd like to, to think for a little bit longer. Otherwise, I'll click to the next slide and point out that this is probably going to be uh, a non-response bias, where people who choose not to fill out the survey, um, you know, they're, they're not going to bother returning it to the activity office, because why would I go out of my way if I don't care about the topic? Why am I working towards someone else's interests when it has nothing to do with what I'm interested in? OK, so to get over that, um, the, the, we decide we're going to just stand there and wait until the person has finished filling out the uh, the questionnaire and then we'll just collect it 
immediately. And again, this is something that's often done, but not, not maliciously. But if I'm someone who, say, for instance, runs the school dances, and I'm handing you a survey asking you about how much you like school dances and whether or not you're going to come to school dances, and I'm standing there watching you fill it out, um, that could definitely introduce a response bias where the person feels that they're obligated to say good things because the person's going to see what they write immediately. And they don't want that person to feel bad. Or maybe they do. I don't know. People are jerks sometimes. All right, we're going to leave that there. Um, and the next slide, I'm, I'm just going to point out, and it kind of fits in nicely as we're talking about bias and misrepresented data, is that when we've done our study, regardless of how we've done it or why we've done it or, or anything like that, we have to actually kind of own our results. Um, so in this particular picture, uh, here's, here's a knight fighting a dragon, which looks like a fossil. And uh, you may be aware that dragons are not real and have never been real on Earth. Uh, or maybe you believe they were. but from a scientific point of view, they weren't. You can't find that fossil and then just say, well, the, I, there's no scientific basis for this, so it must be not there. You have to acknowledge that you found it. Um, likewise, when you do your uh, experiment and you get your results, you can't just say, well, this isn't what I expected or wanted, so I'm just throwing this study in the garbage and it's gone. You've got to accept what your results are and own them. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't comment on why you think they're skewed or why you think they're biased. That's You're always welcome to do that as part of the an analysis and interpretation, but you have to own and accept what the results actually are. So um, <laughs> a few years ago, one of my friends, who's also a teacher, obviously, was um, was doing a, a little thing in his class, and he said, guys, you've got you've to do your homework or you're going to not do well in this class. And he actually did a little thing and he did what percentage of homework students completed and their current mark in the course. And what he found was the students that did less homework actually were doing better in his class. And he was mortified by that result. Um, I should point out that this was a grade 11 workplace class where the material is actually quite easy. Um, it, it isn't hard to do. Um, so doing the homework may not be as important as it would be in a class like, for instance, data management or functions or calculus. But he was like, I have to give them the results of this. I have to tell them what it actually said. I can't just lie about it. And uh, he, he didn't feel good about it, but he did. And I, I forget exactly what his, um, his conclusion was. I think it was that the students that weren't doing the homework were because they understood the stuff so well that they were just immediately jumping to the evaluations without doing the homework and doing fine on them. And the students that were doing the homework were kind of just killing time and not actually finishing anything, including the, the actual work that was being collected and marked was the problem. So he still did learn something from it, but not what he thought he would. Okay. We're going to look at several slides now. And by the way, all these slides are just slides that I downloaded off the internet from various sites. Um, they were all supposedly real. Uh, I, I'm not sure if they actually are or not. And some of them, don't worry too much about what the actual content is. We're just going to talk about why the data is mis misrepresented. Now, this doesn't say the data is wrong or that there's numerical errors in it. That's a completely different issue. It's just saying that the person who's putting together this is putting it together in a way that people are taking away um, false interpretations of what they're seeing. So in this graph here, I look at it and go, okay, so the data starts off high and then it gets low and then it goes up again. And then, okay, so it's kind of all over the place. There's no pattern in this data. However, if you look at the numbers across the bottom, they're in random order. And if I'm allowed to put the numbers in random order, I can make this bar graph look like anything I want. I could put them in an order so that the smallest one's on the left and largest on the right, so it looks like the data is increasing. I could put the um, largest on the, the left, the smallest on the right, make it look like the data is decreasing. Or I could put the, the biggest one in the middle and then kind of go down as I move outwards and make it look like it peaks centrally which are three drastically different things. Whether something gets bigger, gets smaller, or peaks in the middle are drastically different things. But if I randomly choose the order in which I represent those bars, then that's pretty easy to do. So for the next few graphs, I'm going to kind of go to them, ask you a question, and the first one's pretty obvious. It's just what's wrong with this graph. Um, but I'm going to give you a little bit of context if I can, and then I'm going to pause uh, just for a few seconds and continue on. 
I would recommend that you pause the video literally and think about it before you actually jump to the answers. And the reason for that is you're always going to learn more if you think about it before you, you try it. Um, I've always said, I've, I've watched my mechanic fixing my car before and I still can't fix my car. Watching someone do something and doing it yourself are two different things. And knowing the final result is very different than understanding how you got there. So please do try the, the pause the video method and answer the questions on your own. Okay, the first graph, career home run leaders. We have Barry Bonds, Hank Aaron, and Babe Ruth. I want you to ask yourself, um, what is the person who made this graph trying to convey to you? And is that accurate? So pause the video and come back in whenever you're ready and unpause it and we'll continue. So my interpretation of this graph is that the person is trying to show that Barry Bonds and Hank Aaron are significantly better players than Babe Ruth. Just looking at this graph, if I kind of look at the height of Babe Ruth's bar and I compare it to Barry Bonds, Barry Bonds is about three times higher. And what that conveys to me without looking in detail is that Barry Bonds hit about three times as many home runs. However, if I actually read the bars or the, um, the scale on the side, uh, Babe Ruth hit around 714 home runs, whereas Barry Bonds hit just over 760. Now we're talking about a difference of less than 10%, not triple. So a, a good way to fix this graph, if you wanted it to actually be relevant, would be to set the Y scale or the vertical scale so that it starts at zero and goes up to 770. And then you'll see that despite the fact that Babe Ruth is shorter, it's not shorter by a lot. And that would be a way of correcting the graph to make it more representative. And by the way, um, I've seen so many graphs in the newspaper that do this. They're trying to show as much difference as possible. And often there's very, very little difference. Um, I've seen it where they represent um, things like EQAO testing in schools for math scores. And they start the, the, the graph, the Y scale at like 70% and then show how some schools are at 71 and some are at 78. Well, the 78 looks eight times bigger and it's actually not that much as 10% bigger, but it's not as huge difference as people make it out to be. Uh, this graph here, a uh, number of pages of federal tax rules. Now, um, the Y scale on this one is correct. It starts at zero and goes up by 20,000 each time. So that one's not the problem. And if I had to describe this, I would say that the growth rate is linear or possibly a little bit exponential. Uh, but we start off at 400, go to 504 and 8200 and so on. So I want, to, I want you to take a, uh, a look at this graph and tell me what you think is wrong with it or not necessarily wrong. The mathematics of this graph is 100% correct and I know exactly why they did it. But I want you to tell me what your interpretation is and why you don't think that that's what actually is happening. Okay, so um, the, the problem with this graph is in, to do with our horizontal axis. If we look at the first two entries, 400 and 504 pages, um, we go from the year 1913 to 1939, which is a gap of 26 years. The next one, which goes from 504 pages to 8200 pages, happens in just six years. And then we, we go almost double that in nine years, and then there's a 15 year gap and a five year gap and a 10 year gap and an 11 year gap and a 10 year gap and a, a five year gap and a seven year gap. The, um, the bottom scale, while it's in order, has no particular um, pattern to it. It's got some big jumps and some small jumps and it's not acknowledging the difference between them. If it actually spaced these bars out properly so that they were close together if, if the two numbers were five years apart and they were further away if it was 26 years apart, you'd get a slightly different shape. Now, the reason they did that in this case is because the um, these are the years that the actual tax rules were changed and the, a new version came out. It's not like it, from 1913 to 1939, the tax rule guides steadily crept from 400 up to 504 pages. It was 400 pages all the way through and then got a new version released in 1939 that was 504 pages and so on. 
So, um, yeah, it's not that it's wrong. It's just that the interpretation or the what you're getting out of it may not be what you think you're getting out of it. This one is uh, is fun, and I have uh, grade nine students who have done this regularly. So I want you to look at this and see what it's trying to tell you and see why that's not actually what's happening. Okay, um, I don't even know what this is representing, particles per unit area and years. Um, I don't know, fertilizer. I, I've got no idea, I've got no context for this. But I can tell you that the... Um, the line is definitely looks like it's made to be linear or the data looks linear of course lines are linear that's what lines are um, the data looks like it's a linear progression but if i look at the uh, vertical values 100 to 200 is a pretty big jump and then 200 to 300 is actually smaller jump i mean technically it's, it should be the same it jumped by 100 and then the next jump is 200 and it's even shorter than the 100 jumps so the problem with this is that the left scale or the vertical scale is not consistent and that means that this data is not linear it's actually going from 300 to 500 in the same amount of time or in less time you know, the same time as it went from um, 200 to 300. so i think this data is actually exponential if we graphed it with actual proper uh, scales on the horizontal and vertical axes For this one, I'm going to point out that this kind of diagram is called a pictogram. It's very similar to a bar graph, um, which we're going to talk about more in the course. Uh, the difference is that we replace the bar with a picture that kind of represents what it is we're measuring. So this is um, is measuring money. It says net value of production, what it's for, I have no idea. But these bags of money are supposed to represent how much money is there. So I want you to pause for a second and think about why this graph is misleading. Okay, welcoming you back, knowing that you probably never paused it. Um, the first problem that, the, and this was actually something a student pointed out to me, I wasn't my immediate thought, was that where are we really supposed to be measuring how high the bar is or how high the thing is? Are we supposed to be measuring from the top of like the, the very top of the bag, like as far up as it possibly goes or where the bag itself is tied off? Because we know that money doesn't actually get stored in the bag above that tie. That would be just open and falling out. So that was actually an interesting one. I'm not sure exactly where to measure the, the level, but a more important one, and this is actually a fairly common one that's not intentionally done, or sometimes it is, is that um, if we go from the first to second to third bags, they go from 100 to 200 to 300 in height, meaning the second bag is twice as much as the first and the third bag is three times as much as the first. The problem with it though is because it's drawn as a two-dimensional picture, our brain interprets it as an area, not a height. So that second bag, despite the fact it's only two times taller, is actually four times the area of the first bag. And the last bag is nine times the area of the first one. So that's just area. And if we interpret these as physical things, as a physical three-dimensional bag of money, a bag that's three times taller is also three times wider and three times deeper, which means it's not three times bigger, it's 27 times bigger. Um, and so that can mislead your brain into thinking that there's been a significant increase in something despite the fact that there hasn't been. Okay, this one, um, I'm just gonna point out what the, what the graph is actually saying, which I realize you can read, but this is wind creates more jobs and it shows that the um, number of jobs created in the gas and oil industry combined is about 39,079. And I don't know if this was per year or where, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, and then I look down at wind and say, okay, wind created 172,500 jobs. Despite the fact that that seems very straightforward, this graph is hugely misleading depending on what you're trying to use it for think about how this graph could be misleading like what is the person trying to mislead you with uh, if they are trying to mislead you and what is the correct interpretation okay um, 
so the biggest thing about this isn't that the the numbers are different it's that they're trying to say uh, my guess my guess is that by putting the hard hat up there they're representing jobs i mean which that's the title of the, chat, the the graph wind creates more jobs however um if I take a look at number of jobs in the gas and oil industry combined, it increased by 39,000 over whatever period we're talking about, and when increased by 172,500. Well, in North America, that could mean that gas went from having a million jobs to 1,039,000. So that's an increase, but there's a lot of jobs. And wind could have gone from having zero up to 172,500. If this was the year that wind um, wind jobs really came into play, so despite the fact that there were more jobs created in wind uh, than there were in the gas and oil industry, there may be significantly more jobs actually available to get in the gas and oil industry compared to the wind industry, because with a million, if there were a million people in gas and oil, then there's probably a fair number of retirements. They're not new jobs, but there's still lots of jobs available. So that's a possible misinterpretation of this graph. Uh, this one here, uh, monthly energy demand in kilowatt hours. The first thing I'm going to point out is that um, the misrepresentation here has nothing to do with the fact that for reasons I don't know, because I, again, just randomly pulled this off the internet, the months are given in what I think is German. I'm not sure that that's true, but I think they're in German, whereas the rest of the graph is in English. But I, I think you can understand what it's saying. Um, each of the different types of energy being used in a month is, is given a different color. So we have the green is the mobility, which would be stuff like um, car, I don't know, motorcycle, bus, truck, whatever you're doing, bus pass, uh, I guess. Uh, this is this is not necessarily per person. This is per this could be for a community. Uh, anyway, um, so all the different ones are different colors. I want you to look at this graph and see what you could or what you think is wrong with it and how you could easily fix it. Okay, so we look at those bars and we see that they're higher in um, at the beginning and the end, which is actually a continuation because that's how months work um, after December comes January. So basically this is just saying it goes way up in the winter months and way down in the summer months and it fluctuates like that. Well, this is this is something that I don't know why they did it this way, but it's kind of silly. If we look at the, the green parts, the mobility part, the actual height of the mobility section looks about the same every month. It's on the top, so it's like offset from each other, but the, the heights of the green parts are about the same. Well, the auxiliary energy, I'm not even sure what that is exactly or what they're referring to, but the auxiliary energy, the dark blue, also looks to be about the same every month. So do the appliances, so does the lighting, and so does the hot water. Um, hot water may be slightly different from month to month. I, I can't really tell, but it looks similar. The only thing that's really changing is the heating, which is the bottom color, the, I don't even know what to call that, the dark orange, the, the half orange, half gray, whatever it is. But that's the only one that seems to be changing from month to month. Lots of heating in the winter months, no heating in the summer months. So what they really should have done was just move the heating to the top of each of these bars. And by putting the heating on the top, I think you could see that everything else stayed the same pretty much. And that the heating is the only real thing changing from month to month. So an easy way to correct uh, a graph that could be misleading people. Okay, this one, even more interesting. Um, and again, these, these ones are tougher interpretations. These aren't easy ones like the first one where the scales are weird or anything like that. These ones, you actually have to look at it and, and figure out what the person's trying to show you and what is actually happening. So this one here, we have job losses in recent recessions uh, and the horizontal scale, the one, two, three across the top there is showing how many months it's been since we had kind of the maximum number of jobs. So recession would be job losses, like jobs are going down, not up. Okay, and the blue one is the 1990 recession, the um, red one is the 2001 recession, and the current recession, uh, which would be 2008. 
Um, if you, it doesn't actually say that on here, but we can see that we have data up until about 13 months after it started. And we can see that this was produced at the bottom corner there um, in 2009. So this would be the 2008 recession. So first of all, I want you to think about what is this graph trying to convey to you? What are they trying to get you to think about when you look at it? And is it accurate? So take a moment and think about those. This one is trickier. Okay, if you haven't paused yet, or you haven't got an answer yet, maybe pause some more and, and keep thinking about it. Um, but if you've given up on that and you just need to know what the answer is, uh, let's take a look. Okay, first thing that I'm going to note, there, there are a couple things wrong with this, but the first thing I'm going to note is that if you look at all of the three colors, um, the, the green one only goes up to about 14 months, give or take. And that's not wrong. It's just that's all they had data for because that was the present month that this took place in. Now, it looks like green is um, is going down and your brain is interpreting it as continuing to go down. But if we look at the other two, 14 months is where things started to get less worse. So the green, it doesn't give an opportunity to show that it's getting it's going to get better. The blue and the reds ones start to kind of level out at about 14 months and then get better um, a little bit after that but still the same. So it's kind of giving more of a doom and gloom than it was before. Uh, also, if we compare, I'm just gonna compare the blue and the, the green too. Now the blue one, uh, it, its biggest dip looks like it was about 1600 jobs below peak, uh, whereas the green looks like it's about 35 or 3600 jobs below peak. But over that 20 years, the question is, is there been more jobs created? Because if there were more jobs, if there were twice as many jobs, then these two job losses would both represent about the same percentage of job losses. It could be both of these represent one out of every 20,000 people losing their job. It's actually probably more like one out of every, I don't know, whatever it is. But there's, um, it could be actually a similar percentage loss, but they're showing it as a, a number which when you're comparing two different sized populations is not accurate. Um, if you found out that, you know, uh, five people in your class um, uh, died of, of leukemia in a year, that would be a lot different than, or a lot worse than 10 people dying of leukemia in all of North America. Um, despite the fact that it's a lower number, it's still a much bigger percentage. So not knowing the overall size of the job population, um, we could have also had in uh, 2008 or 2007, a big job boom that took our numbers up way higher than they ever were. And 3,500 might actually be, um, or losing 3,500 jobs, you might still have more jobs than you had in 2006. So it may not be a bad thing. It may just be a temporary bad thing, <laughs> but something that is still overall better than it was before. Uh, so there's there's several ways that you could look at this that you may get information that you're not supposed to get by looking at it and thinking about it a little bit more in detail. And our very last one here, um, this is a, was a bigger deal going back uh, several years. So I'm not sure if how many of you would be familiar with it, but there was a, a huge push that vaccinations were causing autism. And it was graphs like this that were used that were trying to show that autism and vaccinations were growing at the same rates, were going hand in hand with each other. And that's what was, was the proof that vaccinations caused autism. I need to be abundantly clear about this. They don't. Vaccinations do not cause autism. They never did cause autism. Autism is not something that happens because of you're injected. It, it just doesn't. That's like saying, you know what, if, um, if you smoke too much, you, you, you're more likely to have been born with six fingers. Um, I don't think that that matters. I, you're like, you have autism as a child or you don't, it doesn't seem to, to be affected by vaccinations or really anything else. You, you have it or you don't. Okay, so anyway, this graph was used to show it. And what they kind of showed was a similar overall trend between the blue bars, which uh, represent the number of um, vaccinations given and the purple line, which is representing the um, autism. The units and everything are meaningless. What they were trying to show was that the, the two were kind of coinciding with each other. I want you to look at the graph even more closely 
and see why that's absolute nonsense. Okay, so the people that were making the argument that these graphs have the same shape were missing out on a very important feature. And that was looking at a year over year transition. So if we go from 88 to 89, vaccinations went down, autisms went up. 89 to 90, they both went up. 90 to 91, they both went down. 91 to 92, vaccinations went down, autism went up. What this is telling me is that in four years, twice they've coincided and twice they haven't. That's complete randomness. Uh, then they both go up together, then one goes down, one goes up, then they both go down together, and the last one doesn't even show what one of the values is. So the result here is basically half the time they do the same thing and half the time they don't do the same thing. That That is not a correlation. That doesn't even show that there there have similarities. That's just showing that some numbers get bigger and some numbers get smaller. That's it. Um, so anyway, doesn't matter. But that, that, that graph is definitely showing something that is not there. Okay, this by no means is a complete list of all the things that can be misrepresented in graphs. There are lots and lots and lots of things that can be done to misrepresent graphs. The idea here is that when you look at a graph, you should ask yourself two questions. What was the person trying to get me to believe by looking at this? And based on what the graph numerically actually says, is that true? Is that actually the interpretation I should take away? And with that, we'll call it uh, an end to this uh, particular presentation. And we'll see you next time.